as well as controlling my peer. So uh, alignment curve, basically it is having, a, a, we have a peripheral force. So when we talk about the molding, so molding is basically uh, is happening because of two factors. One is the uh, central force and the peripheral force. So this peripheral force, so alignment curve is responsible for the peripheral force, which helps in molding process, and it provides a better centration. Peripheral curve for the tear reservoir. So uh, this is uh, the uh, drag drag is the presentation of how actually the orthotherapy works. So as I mentioned, so there is a central pressure, so one pressure, and the other pressure is a peripheral pressure. So the central pressure is uh, given by the eyelid. So eyelid puts up central pressure, and it helps the uh, hydraulic it puts a hydraulic pressure, and the epithelial cells migrate from center to periphery. Then we have peripheral pressure. So this peripheral pressure is again divided into horizontal and vertical pressure. So uh, ideally the horizontal force, you can see, so this is a horizontal force, horizontal. So the force is going horizontally. So this horizontal force is ideally responsible for uh, uh, means uh, migration of the epithelial cells. I will explain you what migration. Basically, either we can migrate the epithelial cell from center to periphery because we have to step in the mid peripheral region. Other way is that we can also migrate the epithelial cells from peripheral part to the mid periphery. So ultimately, what, what is our goal? We have to increase this uh, zone, right? Steep this zone. So we can do by two process. One is by the central pressure and the other by the peripheral pressure. This peripheral pressure is basically uh, the horizontal force is more responsible for the peripheral pressure. So here actually, and this basically, the peripheral pressure is basically from the alignment uh, uh, zone. So this alignment zone is also very, very important for a better uh, myopia control and correction. I will explain in my upcoming slides. So uh, the, as I already mentioned, there are two uh, curves, uh, two designs. One is the XMJ lens and the XM lens. So XMJ is basically uh, till minus five adapter. So what does the, uh, means they have the unique XM curve to help with molding. This is a patented technology XM design. And uh, you, you uh, I, will, I will explain you that how it's different from the normal curve. Then uh, the aspheric design, which is having an enhanced peripheral force. So this enhanced peripheral force means to say that it, 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 it provides more peripheral force from the horizontal side uh, and uh, helps in molding. And it also, as like others, it's, it's, it's responsible for the centration and stabilization of the lenses. Because of this XM design, uh, XM curve, the effectivity of molding is very faster and for the longer period of time. So this here actually, uh, it, it helps to understand that how we can have a better control and correction with the design. So if it's more faster, so uh, it can mold faster, so we'll have a better uh, outcome. And if it can maintain longer molding, mean to say that all throughout the day, we'd have, if we have a stronger myopic defocus force, then that means more the stronger the myopic defocus force, better will be the control. So suppose the mold in the morning hour, the molding, the myopic defocus is in the range of eight to 10 adapter, but by evening or let's say in the afternoon, it, it reduces to two adapter. So that means if the molding myopic defocus is by two adapter in the, in the afternoon, that means it is just behaving like a soft multifocal contact lenses. And soft multifocal contact lenses have the, have the myopic defocus of two to 2.5 adapter because that is the addition power which we are actually adding the lenses. So that means the, if the molding, if we want a better results for the myopia control, we need to have a design where the molding can be maintained for a longer period of time with a stronger uh, uh, myopic defocus. So uh, the high myopic systems, as the name says, the XM lenses, it can correct till my, minus 10 adapter and uh, unique XM curves to help molding. A spheric design, the same thing, like enhanced peripheral force and better centration. So what is the mechanism of XM curve molding? So XM curve molding, as I mentioned that uh, the peripheral force is very, very important and XM design helps uh, to enhance the uh, peripheral force. Uh, how it does? It actually maximize the horizontal divisional force and minimize the vertical divisional force. Now, let me give you an example with this particular uh, slide. So where uh, we are trying to mold a cornea uh, with uh, a particular uh, with the same characteristic value. 
so let's say this is the cornea right and we want to mold this we want to correct this so what we'll do uh, we will migrate the epithelial cells from the center to periphery so the center will become flatter and the peripheral we will have a steeper so this is the steeper zone right so suppose you want to do more then we will move more of the epithelial cells and we can do this but there is a limitation so we can't uh, uh, means uh, migrate uh, the epithelial cells more than 20 micron so there is a limitation so this is the limitation now so suppose we have uh, crossed that we have come to that limit like minus five factor of uh, my IPR. So now, uh, so this is how it, it happens. So it will uh, move the epithelial cells from center to periphery and we'll have a stiffening over here and this area will be flatter. But we want to mold more. We want to give more correction. So what we can do? So the same thing till now. So this is the compressed epithelial depth which is same in both the uh, design. This is the normal edge profile. That means uh, uh, the, uh, the maximum uh, steepening which can be possible with the normal edge profile lenses. Now this is a confirmed edge profile with XM design. So why? So what I mean to say that the epithelial uh, depth is same. This is same for both the uh, So we have migrated just the same way what these lenses have done from this from the central part. But still, we have a bigger edge, uh, this uh, steepening, steepening zone. How we have done this? So this is done by XM curve design. So what does XM curve design do? Just uh, I will explain in my upcoming slide. So this is what we have done. So this is the correction with the normal edge profile, and this is the correction with the XM edge profile. So the power correction is more with. Uh, XM design compared to the normal edge profile or conventional orthokeratology lens. So uh, just for your understanding, so this is the curve. This is the basically this is the X, XM curve design. And this is the normal F4 lens curve design. So uh, so this is the normal F4 X curve lens. So this is the cornea. So this is the initial fitting. So when we have started uh, to molding the lens, so this is how the lens will sit on the cornea in both the cases right so you can see this is more steeper right so this will mold more so now in the final molding this is how it is so same way it is uh, confirming with the cornea and this is also confirming with the cornea but in this case the uh, since it's the xm design so this xm curve this is the xm curve so this xm so this uh, this blue one is the curve and this uh, red one is the cornea so this is how it is confirmed with the cornea to get more power. This is with the normal uh, design lens, um, normal profile. Uh, I'll try to explain more. So this is the extreme reverse geometry design and this is the conventional reverse geometry design. Eyelid pressure is there. Peripheral curve pressure is there. Same here also, but design because this, this curve is different. The design is different. This curve is different. This relief curve is different. The curve, which the curve uh, shape factor is different. So that is why it enhances the peripheral uh, pressure. Uh, basically, uh, it increases the horizontal pressure more than the vertical, and we we'll, can we can correct more of the uh, uh, correct, uh, correction. So this is uh, the design on the cornea final lens. This is how it is giving more pressure and uh, trying to uh, means, uh, trying to uh, migrate these peripheral epithelial cells from center to periphery. So, so there are two. So uh, the gist is that so there are two ways of uh, increasing the uh, steepness of the cornea. One by migrating the cells from cent from center to mid periphery. So this is done by the normal uh, RG profile lenses. The other uh, way is that we use two factors. One, of course, the migration of central uh, epithelial cells from center to mid periphery. And the other way is that migrating the peripheral epithelial cells from peripheral part to the mid peripheral part. So by this also, we can increase the stiffness and we can increase, we can collect more diopters of uh, myopia. So these are a few examples of how we have done. So, 
so uh, now we have understood uh, do i have time now so uh, i'll try to finish as, as soon as possible so ortho keratology uh, we know it's the best way of controlling myopia but uh, i mentioned in my previous slide that the range varies from 52 to 90% so how we can actually have a better uh, means control with the lenses uh, how we can increase the control so we can increase the control by of course uh, by having a better uh, myopic view focus the lenses and I, I will try to explain how we can we can actually do that so if you see the normal uh, means a, uh, ratio between the myopia means the treatment zone uh, flattening of the treatment zone and the stiffening of the rim that is the mid peripheral zone it varies in the range of uh, 1 to 1.5 means uh, 1 to 1.5 diopter ratio so 1 is to 1.5 diopter ratio so suppose the flattening is uh, by 3 diopter then maybe the stiffening will be by 4.5 diopter let's say so this is the ratio which is actually common with the uh, means orthokeratology lenses and based on the study we say that I means, uh, means whosoever is actually trying to uh, do the the ratio by 1.5 to is to 1 ratio then the control will be in the range of 50 to 60 percent and if we can increase the uh, stiffening rim stiffening factor then we can have a better control uh, why we can have a better control as i already mentioned that if we can increase the stiffening ring that means we'll have a more myopic defocus more myopic defocus mean to say longer uh, means a myopic defocus in the waking hours so if you, the durability will be more because anyway it means uh, it's it's a it's a reversible process right so if the myopic defocus is still remains stronger in the night hours in the evening hours then of course the control will be better than the lenses which have a lesser myopic defocus. So that is why we have seen that soft multifocal contact lenses where the uh, myopic defocus uh, uh, is only by 2 to 2, 2, 2, 2.5 diopter, the uh, control is in the range of 30 to 40 percent. That is the only reason. So, and that is the only reason why ortho since the uh, molding, this myopic defocus is in the range of 8 to 12 diopters, that is why they have a better control than. Uh, soft contact lenses but if we can increase the wave uh, means uh, the molding factor for a longer hours then we can have more better myopia control so this is one example like say 43 adapter of, uh, of uh, 42 adapter of uh, flattening of the uh, normal cornea so target refraction is minus three focal lens design so if you see the uh, treatment zone uh, it's a uh, steep and uh, flatter by uh, three adapters and this area, the stiffening is by 4.5. So the ratio is 1.5 factor. So this is the uh, normal ideal we can do. Here also, uh, molding is happening, right? So cells are migrating from central, uh, cells are migrating from center to mid periphery. Molding, sorry, molding is happening. We can have a myopic defocus. We can have a better uh, near vision, means uh, distance vision with this lens. Everything is fine, but the ratio is only 1.5. Uh, the ratio of uh, steep rim versus uh, this treatment zone is only 1.5. Another example here, the ratio is 1.3 that 1.3. So see, okay. Uh, GOB has done a study, a retrospective study on 204 eyes, uh, 102 cases with, uh, with the average uh, age. I mean, with the average uh, year of study is the four, four, five to five, five years, like 5.46 years. So this study is done on 102 cases. That means 204 eyes with average study follow-up years of 5.5 years, right? So what they have found that they have found that the uh, I'll just skip this. Uh, so they found that the control. So control is more uh, with. Uh, um, so this is the control factor. So we they have seen. So this is the uh, initial um, means. Uh, so they have categorized in three three things. So with the initial, so when uh, the power is less than two diopter, we know that ortho keratology lenses uh, uh, the the results are better with the high diopter. Like uh, if the power of the patient is having power of somewhere around more than uh, three or four diopter, then the control is better. So that is with the previous study what we have learned uh, in 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 ortho keratology design. So so initial two diopter. And initial, uh, if the power is in initial uh, two adapter, if it is more than two adapter, and then total. So this is the one factor they have considered. So power, low low power, more power, 
and then the other factor they have considered is the age again the age factor is very very important because the progression rate is more in the smaller ages so uh, age less than 9 9 years more than 9 years and total so if you see the control factor so they have seen that if the power is less than 2 diopter the control is in the range of uh, some around 68 to 69% if it uh, if the power, the uh, means, uh, power is more than 2 diopter then the control is in the range of 80% and the total average is somewhere around uh, this uh, 75% in case of if the age is less than 9 years if the age is more than 9 years then the average is somewhere around 87% same in in other way the same study uh, this is the other way of representing the uh, graph representation uh, one adapter progression in the initial before orthokeratology and with uh, initial uh, less than 9 years of in uh, age with uh, less than 2 adapter and with uh, more than 2 adapter and the total so this is the same uh, in uh, the representation so this is the study about this so what we have found from this study that 87% of the orthokeratology uh, uh, 80 87% of the control is possible with uh, ortho gov orthokeratology lenses and why it is so it is because of this factor which i discussed earlier so the the ratio of uh, or uh, gov lenses uh, because of this xm curve design is uh, is not in the range of 1.5 to 1.3 it's in the range of 2 to 3 is to 1 one example same like a uh, high power so we have to try to explain with the minus 7 uh, adapter yeah so the ratio you can see it's 2.3 this is the low power with minus 2.75 adapter again you see the ratio is still. even in the low adapter also the ratio is more than 1.5 to this to 2 to two. it's actually uh, so in, in this case you can see it's 3.6 so better the ratio higher the ratio better will be the control and this is possible because of the xm curve design so as i explained this xm curve design is actually helping uh, for a faster molding as well as to maintain the uh, myopic defocus that means it induces more myopic defocus with the xm curve design Uh, because of the alignment curve uh, which actually gives uh, more uh, horizontal peripheral force and helps to retain the uh, myopic defocus for a longer wearing out and of course a better uh, means more power so more myopic defocus over here so more uh, stiffening of the cornea in the mid peripheral uh, so this is all about orthokeratology i just want to Uh, conclude this with one more uh, technology available in our armatorium that is the uh, soft contact lenses which is a day wear lenses this is not orthokeratology lenses but this is again a very unique design so this is a soft contact lens for myopia control but this is not a multifocal contact lens just try to uh, means understand that this is not a multifocal contact lens this is a different design altogether day wear lenses and this mimics the design of the orthokeratology and that is why it's known as soft okay uh, and it gives a peripheral rim so the power the myopic defocus is here also it's same like orthokeratology is in the range of 8 to 20 diopters this is the design of the lens so if you see we have we, we have done a topography on top of the contact lenses so this is with the contact lens so this is the flatten and this is the stiffening area so you can see here so this is again the myopic defocus is more it's not like the multifocal contact lenses if you do a topography with the multifocal contact lenses you will not get this uh, myopic defocus you will get somewhere in the range of more than that will two adapters right so two adapter or 2.5 adapter but here if you see the difference is more than 10 adapter right so 43 to 51 so 10 to 8 to 20 12 to 20 adapter of difference can be possible with the soft focal lenses how this lens is designed this lens is uh, we, we there is a flexor in the lens in, in the 360 degree so uh, so this is how it is so there is a flexor so on 360 degree so you can see a flocin uh, just like orthokeratology we don't recommend to do a flocin analysis with this lens because the soft lens this is just for understanding this is a high molecular uh, weight to polish flocin has been used just for your understanding that the, it will, it will just mimics the design of orthokeratology but it's a soft lens day wear lenses so it it corrects till minus 15 adapter of a uh, uh, myopia uh, and it uh, as far as astigmatism is concerned it corrects till minus 1.75 to 1.5 adapter of astigmatism
so few examples uh, so what are the benefits of soft focal lenses better comfort it's a day wear lens uh, pbs uh, multifocal contact lens uh, means pbs technology it simulates the orthocatal region excellent centration bigger optical zone uh, what do i mean by bigger optical zone here that uh, uh, if the power increases uh, the optical zone can decrease like uh, though orthocatal gob lenses can correct till minus 10 adapter even we have seen cases with minus 11 and minus 12 adapter also but uh, more the power correction is the optical zone will become smaller and that is why few patients can have a complaint of uh, halos uh, because of this so optical zone will be smaller but with soft focal lenses this problem is solved so they have a bigger optical zone for better far vision and they are there is no complaint of halos and there and it can correct uh, astigmatism till minus 1.75 so this is a study uh, based on uh, meta analysis study with soft okay with other orthocatal lenses study so we can see the axial length uh, is better with this uh, axial length uh, control is better with uh, soft okay lenses compared to the other orthocatal study done uh, in the, by different uh, researchers even with they have compared with the atropin also 0 .05. Uh, safety, uh, this is just some picture representation, it's a one year safety, so you can see everything is uh, normal, cornea is very uh, clear. So, this is all from my side, uh, I would again like to thanks for your patient hearing. I don't know, I make it uh, uh, easy or uh, or it's, it's a little difficult to for you to understand, uh, but I've tried to uh, explain you the how orthocratology works and what are the things we need to uh, understand for a better outcome for microcontrol. So thank you from my side. Thank you, sir, for such an informative section. Many of us are hearing this for the first time. It was really useful for us. So we are moving to the discussion part. Before that, uh, apologizing now, we have started our live streaming on the YouTube. Sorry for the delay. It helped us to do some technical errors. So moving to the discussion part. We have received some questions from our participants. One such question is, can orthokeratology lenses be given to people appearing for Machel Navy and other profession to hide their refractive error? Uh, so uh, Dr. Vinay has replied to the question that it is just an option, but uh, could be temporary and rigorous on stopping lenses. Since it, no, it is not a uh, permanent procedure, he is asking, is there any ethical issue for doing it for profession which needs uncorrected six by six? Can you comment on this question, sir? You want you want me to answer this? Yeah, if possible. Or Dr. Vinay? Okay, so uh, I rightly mentioned, uh, ethically, it's uh, not uh, uh, means, uh, promoted uh, as uh, for army because of what the criteria as per their uh, uh, standard is that uh, uncorrected vision. So anyway, this is a correction, right? We are giving some correction. So they are asked for uncorrected vision and this is an uncorrected, uh, this is not an uncorrected visual equity, whatever they're achieving with orthocatalogy. So ethically, this is not uh, correct, of course. Uh, uh, and uh, whosoever means, uh, I have seen people doing this, of course, they are doing this uh, for, of course, for the benefit of the uh, candidates, but they also make it very clear to the candidates also that, see, we are not uh, here to uh, get your medical things cleared, but basically, if you want a con correction, we can do this, and, uh, uh, and, and it is up to you how you manage this thing. So, basically, it's a... Uh, our job is just for a correction, but if something uh, to be written, then we, we know that uh, the medical board, uh, they say uncorrected visual activity. So if, the un if they are saying it's uncorrected, then this is not an uncorrected visual activity. We are actually correcting the visual activity with orthocratic logic. So I hope I am able to answer this. No, I, I absolutely agree with it. With, with you, you know, uh, it depends. We have to actually talk to the patients first, clearly what is the aim of the procedure before going ahead, especially in these cases. Thank you, sir. 
moving to the next question is it a painful process uh, since it compresses the central cornea miss anu kuriyakos have already answered to the question that it will be uncomfortable at first but it won't hurt the cornea and will not be painful because of the design of the orthokeratology lenses that is reverse geometry design so do does anybody has to comment on that or we can just move on to the next question for myopia control in uh, children using orthokeratology lenses how long it will it would take to get a noticeable result and what are the strategies that we should follow as an optometrist as well as from the parents patient's side so sir you want to answer or i will No, please go ahead. I have no practical experience with auto case, so um, we are, yes, we are, you know, so, hoping that uh, we can clear a lot of things here. Yes, thank you, sir. So uh, basically, when we when we talk about the outcome, uh, so outcome starts not with the orthokeratology fitting; <clears throat> it starts with uh, uh, the counseling part. Uh, what do you mean by counseling part? Is that uh, we need to motivate the parents uh, that this is a we are trying to slow down the progression of my pia we are not trying to stop the progression of my pia so that is the first thing which needs to be very very clear in the mind of parents secondly uh, uh, we also uh, when 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 we talk about the orthokeratology treatment so it doesn't start with the fitting it doesn't start with the topography it starts with the other visual assessment like anu ma'am already explained that it starts with the binocular assessment first of all it starts with the visual acuity then the binocular assessment of the children so based on the binocular assessment we can decide that orthokeratology is the right or the optical intervention is the right is the ideal thing for the patient or not what do i mean to say that uh, suppose a binocular there is a binocular disturbance ac by ac is not good so first of all we need to control that part once we do that then of course we can go for the uh, orthokeratology and also even the visual vision therapy uh, also can be one of the important factor for my pe control so this all needs to be understand initially and then we can op go for option and if everything is managed well then of course uh, the results are very good there is no doubt about that that is what all studies say but yeah if there is some failure then failure is not because of the technology it's because of the understanding from the optometry point of view we need to do the better uh, means uh, uh, means counseling uh, there are lot of pro, uh, means uh, we square also provides the i think mr vinay and mr swastik have already explained to you that we also provides the protocol that how you should start uh, your myopia control clinic so uh, uh, what need to be done first how you need to counsel the children so there are some online uh, tools available uh, from uh, international uh, orthokeratologist like uh, uh, from uh, myopiaprofile.com this is is a very I means means one of the best orthokeratologist uh, or myopia control for uh, even the vision therapist uh, in worldwide so there is a online tools available where parents themselves can go and log in and they can see that what is the risk factor for the patient so they just need to fill all the forms the all, all the history about the children the parents and they himself themselves will come to know that yeah my children is in the high risk factor so once they found and once they understood that they, their children is in the high risk factor then of course they are already motivated so now they know that oh now i need a my pay control option once they come to you with this thing or you counsel their pay, pay, uh, parents with all these tools then once they are motivated then your job is to understand that how we should proceed we should go directly with the orthokeratology lens or we need to see that is there any requirement of binocular uh, management binocular visual management so these all needs to be understand and then of course uh, with all these things we can have a better result Uh, roughly, you know, when will we start seeing the results with orthokeratology? Sir, uh, I think, uh, yeah, six months. Uh, in six months, you can actually able to understand that yes, the results are good. Because uh, if you see like one adapter, or then if, if it's not increasing by point five adapter in six months, then of course uh, you can easily uh, make it out that yes, I'm, we are getting a bit better, better results. And, and in terms of refractive correction, how long will it take? Uh, it takes two days sir uh, again depending on the power uh, mm -hmm. if the power is very low like 0.5 uh, means uh, two two adapter three adapter then of course you can get in one day one night only they can have six six vision but as i mentioned this six six vision will not for a long hours in the initial day 
so if you talk about the uh, means everything final then in a week they will have uh, 12 to 13 hours of uh, vision correction 6x vision with a better myopic due focus uh, uh, with a 7 days follow up so within 7 days everything will be perfect for for uh, even for a high diopter also right thank you thank you sir uh, next question is please comment on the relation with various myopia control lenses and good corneal thickness and also about possible keratoconus progression control uh, vinisha can you add on this uh, well i'm not sure whether ortho k can control keratoconus progression it's an entirely different uh, you know pathological mechanism it doesn't sir yeah. it doesn't yeah 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 uh, various myopia control lenses practically i have no experience with any of these ओनलीफ्रैक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवेक्टिवे
uh, information about the whole anterior segment and not just the anterior surface of the cornea. So, uh, what does these machines measure? They measure various aspects to give an idea about the shape of the cornea. The radius of the curvature is one aspect, then the power of the cornea, and then the height. So, what are the applications? Uh, basically, more commonly used in screening corneal, I mean, or ocular disorders like ectating disorders like keratoconus, PMD, or even contact lens warpage. It's refractive surgery pre and post. The aim in corneal surgeries too. If uh, you are suspecting any cause of irregular astigmatism in post surgery suture removal or manipulation to get a smooth corneal surface in very irregular cornea for IOL purpose calculation, this helps. And of course, the today's topic in contact lens fitting, especially in special cases. Most common is for surgery, refractive surgery, and corneal ectasia. These are the various machines available. And what I have access is to what is called as oculizer, which is a which is actually a, a pentacam with a little software modification. So most of the discussion will be based on this machine. But then the basic principles in understanding any corneal topography is the same. Now, this is the most common uh, picture which you see <coughs> in uh, uh, most of the you know most of the machine printouts. This is called as a quad map. And when you see this. What are the things that you look for? The first thing to look for is the demographic. I mean, is the, I mean, you know, is the investigation which you have is of the correct patient, I, when was it done? You know, what type of machine uh, was used? And then one other important factor is the quality of the uh, examination. I'll come to that later. Then you can see multicolored picture. What does these colors matter mean? If it is in the green or yellow zone, it means you know you are in the safe zone. But if it is hotter colors, it basically means like the red signal stop. It may not be normal. Relook deeper into these areas, and the cooler colors means it is a flatter or you know a lower uh, in a curvature map. So, if you see this picture and if you see the colors, you see bizarre arrangement of color. Very steep. I mean, very steep areas here. Very flat areas here. So is this really irregular? Is this abnormal? But then before you really assess that, look at the, what is called as a QS in uh, Pentacam and uh, Oculizer, which is a quality indicator. It is in red. You don't have to actually see what is written here. That is the advantage of Oculizer and Pentacam. It is flagged, color flagged. You know, uh, I, if there are no colors, it is normal. If there is red, it is abnormal, absolutely abnormal. And doubtful is yellow one. Now look at this picture here and look at the time here and see what has happened. This is after a blink, okay? The whole surface is smooth and the quality has become normal and it looks much, much, much better, right? So that is one of the first things which you have to assess when you see a picture. Now going to interpretation of maps per se, when you are given a map like this, what are, what, what is a, what are the things to look for? You have to see what each picture means. The first thing to look at is the curvature map. Okay, when you see curvature, it means how much of the surface is curved or what is the dioptric power of the corneal surface. There will be, you know, numerical values given along with that. So look at this. And in this curvature map, what is to be looked at? Now, uh, simply uh, putting it, any, you know, topography is a study of symmetry. Okay, how symmetrical is the map? Symmetry between the upper half and the lower half of the curvature map. If you look here, it is practically very symmetrical in the upper part and lower part. Or symmetrical uh, uh, topography means it is practically a normal topo. Okay, then look at the values. You can see the same case here. The astigmatism is very normal. Then there is a K-max, which is the steepest, con steepest point on the surface. All those are with the normal limit. So this is the second part to look at. For symmetry, then look at the values. Now, how, how what is a, but, but before going into that, one very important thing to look at is what is the, uh, you know, uh, abs scale used. Commonly used is absolute scale, which means that one color always indicates one curvature. For example, here the yellow means 45 in all 
you know prints with the uh, absolute scale yellow will be fortified but then normalized scale is different you can see it's the same uh, you know picture with different uh, mass scales so normalized scale is not routinely used because it is very difficult to understand and it is little difficult to compare so look at the scale and then look at the symmetry and the pattern you know about the bow tie the common is what is called as a symmetrical bow tie then round oval symmetric irregular what are this this is actually a round uh, pattern then oval pattern of the anterior surface this is symmetrical bow tie this is actually a placido disc and this is a pentacam one is a shape front based so this is a symmetrical bow tie and this is an inferior steepening and a symmetrical bow tie with superior steepening just to get you you know to understand what what is meant by the pattern and this is terribly irregular anterior surface you can see how irregular the plaster springs are in this picture so this is the sum of the patterns you see now uh once you look at the you know uh, this picture curvature picture the next thing to look is how does it compare with the other eye if you see here this is a right eye picture and this is a left eye picture what do you see the left eye looks like a mirror image of the other right so again this is a normal feature and this is called as enantiomer morphism okay these are the small points which help you in saying that this might be a normal topo and there is no abnormality next thing in a you know <clears throat> tomography is to look at the pachymetry map okay uh, so it usually has a dome shape from thin to thin peripheral thickening and you have the absolute values here and where is the location so look at the thinnest point it is 552 anything above 500 for uh, you know for the sake of discussion can be considered as normal and anything below that should always raise a red flag now the next two maps are called as elevation maps it's a little difficult to understand the concept of elevation it actually means uh, how much the cornea surface is elevated above a surface of reference now how do you get this reference surface the computer calculates it from the value of the that particular corneal surface it calculates a surface which actually fits best into that cornea and then how much above this arbitrary surface is a one point or how much below it is so this is a normal one this is why i say it's normal because this this is a kind of hourglass pattern this green area means this is where the best fit sphere actually touches the surface of the cornea the yellow I mean blue areas of the coolest uh, colors indicate what are the, the areas which are below the surface and the warmer area means points which are above the surface okay so this is a you know another uh, uh, you know print out from the packe map i mean sorry from the oculus it's slightly difficult again to get the concept of uh, uh, you know uh, this thing what it uh, does is it actually removes the you know central steepest area 3 3 mm and then calculates and best fit sphere to give the, the 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 final output so basically you have to understand that if it is green here it is normal if there is any yellow round in the lower picture there is a, you know suspicious of abnormality and if this is red the ab, it, the cornea become being abnormal cornea is very high and these lines are important because this is red line is what is the cornea and the other three are normative data so the red line should follow these dotted lines if there is any abnormality or any sharp sheep I mean, sorry sharp fall or raise it is an abnormal cornea what it means is that or what it denotes is from the thinnest point how fast the cornea is thickening towards the periphery that is another value of normal uh, norm, you know normative value which you have to consider and finally this is the d value again a statistical index you don't have to remember the number if it is yellow suspicious red abnormal so this is in natural how to read a topo now let's go to uh, another case here now if you see this picture what is the first thing you do look at the patient okay forget that you have done that the next thing is qs quality says okay fine then come to the curvature map what is the first thing you do when there is a curvature map is the color you know any hotter colors there no then look at the upper half and the lower half how symmetrical are they 
In this one, it is quite symmetrical. Look at the values here. How much is astigmatism? Not much. Okay, how much steep is the cornea? 45. So this probably, and what is the shape here? It is a symmetrical, you know, dumbbell shape. So probably this is a normal anterior curvature. Next, look at the packy map. I mean, again, colors are normal. What is the thinness? 530. Well, good cornea. And curvature, it is normal, normal shape. The hourglass pattern in anterior and posterior elevation. So this is a normal topography. And uh, again, this also is absolutely normal. We don't, we won't give much importance to this product. Now, look at this example. Quality is good, but then see at the center, there is some hot color. So is it abnormal? What is the symmetry? Not much of a symmetry, slight superior steepening or superior widening of the dumbbell here. But then if you see the absolute values here, at the five millimeters zone, it is 44.4 and 45.5. Just about one diopter difference, practically normal. Mild steepening here, but uh, astigmatism is also not very high. Steepest cornea, 45.9, 46, reasonably okay uh, steepness. Probably it is normal. Now look at the packing map, quite thick cornea. Thinness is 598. And uh, what is the elevation? Hourglass pattern, slightly broken hourglass, but then it is normal. Okay, again, uh, bad display is also normal. So this is another normal uh, uh, print. Now look at this patient, for instance. How will you read this? Quality, good. How is color is good? How is the symmetry? Good pattern, symmetric dumbbell. So this is practically normal curvature, but then look at the thickness. How thick is the cornea? There is, you know, there is redness there. Okay, so yes, it's a warning sign. Thinnest point here is 467. Quite thin cornea, right? Now look at the elevation map, practically normal here. So is this abnormal? Is this, when you see thinning cause for cornea, what do you think? Is it keratoconus? Well, there is no definite evidence from this picture to say that this is keratoconus other than the cornea being thin. So come next is comes the importance of this display. Again, this is also normal. So is this a, a normal cornea? With that single image picture, I mean, single eye picture, we would say probably this is a normal cornea, but thin. And look at the other eye. What do you see? Uh, it is actually the mirror image. The enantiomorphism is there. So we can brand this as a normal but thin cornea. Okay, the only problem is this eye may not be suitable for any refractive surgery purposes. Other than that, this is a normal cornea. Now look at this. Good quality, but red print. Okay, very steep cornea. So is it normal or is it abnormal? How symmetrical is this? Very symmetrical, almost symmetrical dumbbell, very steep cornea, astigmatism is quite high. So is this keratoconus? Look at the packy map. Quite thin cornea, I mean thick cornea, thinness is 540. Again, look at the posterior and anterior and posterior elevation, quite normal. So is this a keratoconus? Again, with this picture, it is difficult to say. With this, just a quad map, we can brand it as normal, but we should always look for further other uh, indicators. Here also, the bad display is also, all parameters are within normal, except that, you know, K-max is flagged because it's quite thick, I mean, quite steep. Otherwise, it is a normal steep cornea. It is not keratoconus. Now, look at this one. Uh, quality, good. How is the symmetry? Quite asymmetric, right? The upper part is, you know, greenish yellow. Lower part is more yellowish, more steeper. Look at the five millimeter uh, number. Here, 41.5 and here, 43.5. There is a two diopter steepening on the inferior aspect. Now, I'm not, you would have heard about the criteria of Rabinowitz for diagnosis. What does it say? An inferior steepening of more than 1.4 to 1.5 is a factor favoring keratoconus. But how steep is the cornea? Practically normal, uh, you know, uh, case here. The steepest is 43.6 only. But, is, but there is a significant inferior steepening. Look at the packy here normal uh, elevation 
reasonably normal. There is nothing abnormal here, except that there is a central island, what is called as a localized area of elevation in the anterior part and low posterior part. But anything below 12 here and 18 here is considered normal. So from this quad map, we may say this is normal, but then before we brand, look at the other uh, factors. Again, here also it is normal, except for this, it is a little suspicious. But then seeing this eye, we may say this might be a normal cornea. Well, we cannot advise a refractive surgery, we will wait. Again, before we brand one eye normal, always compare it with the other eye. So what is the second eye picture? This is the picture. Very steep cornea, highly you know irregular surface and so I mean asymmetrical surface. So just the steep inferiorly. Then, if you can see, the steep axis is quite you know there is a V shape, which is called a skewing of the steeper axis. So this is quite abnormal, and this is classic of keratoconus. Look at the thickness. What is how thick is this? Four eighty seven. Now look at the elevation. There is a localized elevation which is more than 36 microns here. And look at the posterior elevation, more than 69 local central island. This is classic keratoconus feature. So one eye has, you know, keratoconus, and the other eye, some features, but then no. What do you brand it as? It is a suspect keratoconus, or probably you can say it's FFKC. Terminology is controversial here, but then that is definitely a suspicious of keratoconus in the right eye. So frank keratoconus in one eye and suspect in the other eye. Now look at this picture. Again, good quality. How symmetrical is it? Very symmetrical, but steeper in the horizontal axis against the rule. Good corneal thickness. So is it normal? Uh, look at the elevation. What do you see? Very high elevation, localized island in the posterior surface. So what does this mean? Is it normal? No, this is definitely abnormal, but rest all pictures are normal. So what do you call this as? Look at the belly bad display, belly nambulistic display. The, this, there is a red circle here. That means the posterior elevation is definitely abnormal. So this is what may be called as subclinical keratoconus. There is no clear, even if you do a, you know, your refraction, you will not get any scissoring here. There will not be any clinical features, but only in topo or tomography, you get features suggestive of keratoconus. Now, what is this? Severe against the rule astigmatism, or what is called as crap claw. Inferior part, this white area means there is no data capture. Why is that? Look at the shape of the cornea. Very irregular here, very thinning. This is classic pellucid marginal degeneration. But not all crap claws are pellucid marginal degeneration. Look at other. Um, printouts also. There is central thinning, periphery is okay. Again, central steepening only. Uh, so this means this is a keratoconus which has got a pellucid like picture. And this picture, again, quality not really good. But look at the map, very irregular. In, in conditions like this, you repeat, must take multiple times, okay, to make sure that this is. This quality can be affected because of the tear film, because of problem in taking, and again, in conditions where the surface is very irregular. So that is where you have to, uh, that is why you have to take multiple picture to make sure that your technique and the corneal surface is not affected by the tear film irregularity. So this is a highly irregular cornea, and this is how an irregular astigmatism looks like on topography. Now, this is this is the picture. It's actually DALK after suture removal. You can see there is significant change in the irregularity here, uh, some amount of uh, smoothening. And this is the difference picture, which shows post-suture removal, pre-suture removal, and how much of flattening in the horizontal axis has happened after suture removal. These are called difference maps, useful in conditions like this. And again, this is post myopic LASIK, which shows significant flattening in the center. This is after topo-guided PRKCAXL, the change in topography. So difference maps are other kind of printouts which you can use in various <clears throat> conditions to give an outline or to understand what is the change happening uh, from one point of time to the next point of time. I think I'll stop with that. Thank you.
and probably we can take questions if there are any. Thank you, sir. It is really a useful section. Stepping to the next section, contact lens option in character on corners, and it will be handled by Ms. Pavadi, Faculty of Sustuda School of Optometry and Visual Sciences. Moving to you, ma'am. We can have a discussion after the end of the session, so feel free to ask any questions in the chat box. So, good morning, everyone. Myself, Parvati Ara. Uh, faculty from Sushruta School of Optometry, uh, Girdara Institute. So today I'm going to discuss about the contact lens options in keratoconus. So when considering the fitting process of keratoconus, we need to consider cone position, cone size and shape, degree of myopia, corneal astigmatism, corneal radius, corneal toricity, corneal eccentricity value, corneal topography, disease progression, degree of progression, rate of progression, then visual acuity and contact, contact lens tolerance. So coming into the fitting options, first of all, we consider thick toric soft contact lenses, which are rarely used. And second one is silicon hydrogen materials, uh, examples, Kerasov, Paisi, Bosch and Long. Then piggyback contact lens system, hybrid lens, contact lenses and scleral contact lenses. So first one, fitting soft contact lenses. We usually uh, accept this in the early stage of progression or in case of uh, gas permeable contact lens intolerance. And usually in this case, the astigmatic component is corrected with over spectacles. The other option in soft contact lens soft flex, uh, is soft flex soft K cone. So they are double lenticulated lenses with structural stabilizing ring and two pressure balancing fenestrations are included. So they are made with definitive silicon hydrogel material. Next is Kerasoft IC or Art Optical or Boshan Long. So they have a BOZR of range from 7.4 to 9.4 mm in 0 0.20 step increasing and total diameter 14.5 mm in 0 0.50 steps and lens designs are available in aspheric as well as prism ballast. Then power range start since PRS plus 20 diopter to minus 20 diopter, cylinder as minus 0 0.50 diopter to minus 12 diopter, axis one degree to 180 degree in one degree step incre increment. Then material which I use this definitely material or silicon hydrogen. Next is piggyback contact lens. So piggyback contact lens act as a carrier, that is soft lens act as a carrier overing, overlying uh, gas permeable contact lens. So usually ultra thin disposable lenses are used for this purpose. And this piggyback contact lens option is used to increase uh, the comfort and reduce the risk of epithelial aberration by a glass permeable contact lens. And it is more complicated because care and maintenance is required for two material types and overall, uh, oxygen transmissibility is reduced since silicon hydrogel offers advantage as the carrier contact lens. 
Next, piggyback on excellence design, the soft carrier designs comes in, uh, comes in total diameter of range starting from 12.5 to 14.5 mm diameter. Central thickness of about 0 0.10 mm. Counter sink is about 8 to 9.8 mm diameter and PVP is available as plano. In optic or uh, rigid carrier, consists of a total diameter of 8 to 9.8 mm. Uh, BVP is available from minus 3 to minus 15 point diopter and tricurve designs are available also. Next is hybrid contact lens. So hybrid contact lens act as a soft and rigid design which combine to form a true one-piece contact lens. So it is suitable for uh, early to moderate keratoconus cases and only limited parameters are available and they have relatively poor oxygen transmissibility low uh, due to low decay materials. So this is the picture of hybrid uh, lens in situ. Next is an option in hybrid contact lens is clear cone. So the peculiarity of clear cone is uh, the new hybrid skirt design lands inside the limbus and extends onto the sclera. It provides an optimized lacrimal lens or tear lens. And it, uh, despite the location of cone, it, the visual axis is centered to optic axis and wall design clears the vast majority of ectasias without bearing. So clear cone is available in 11 different walls, three of which can be ordered in three different skirt curvatures, that is flat, medium, and steep. The fit of the vault is independent of the fit of the skirt curve. Each, each should be fitted separately. So coming into the detail, uh, D, uh, clear cone is available in DK of 100 and water content 27 percentage, diameter 14.5 mm, vault 100 to six, uh, 600, third curvature, steep, medium, or flat, uh, sphere power plus 2 to minus 8 diopters, minus 8.5 to minus 15 diopters, plus 2.50 to plus 5. Then wearing indications are, is usually prescribed as daily wear and replacement schedule is recommended for 6 months and lens care is taken, taken over by hydrogen peroxide disinfection. Next option is synergize. That is, they have high DK center and low DK skirt. They, uh, due to that, Advanced silicon hydrogel material provide high oxygen permeability and they actually compromise corneas to minimize corneal stress and they have a patent uh, reverse geometry vaulted design clears the vast majority of ectasia without bearing and optimized uh, tear lens and optic center over visual axis is also provided. So this is the first hybrid contact lens with a high DK silicon hydrogel skirt designed for specialized. And it also promotes eye health while giving you irregular cornea, keratoconus, and ectasia patients an unprecedented combination of superior vision and all day comfort. So, when comparing the clear cone with ultra health, the GP characteristics, the refractive index is mostly common, uh, same for both. And modulus is 11504 clear cone and 1314 for ultra health. The luminous transmittance is greater than 90 percentage 90 for clear cone and 87 percentage for ultra health. UVA transmittance is 18 percentage for ultra health. UVB transmittance is 3.3 percentage. Wetting angle is 42 degree for clear cone and 34 degree for ultra health. Specific gravity 1.10. For ultra health, it is 1.15. And TK 100 for clear cone and 130 for ultra health. Now, now comparing the soft cut the soft skirt characteristics of uh, clear cone and ultra health. The material is made up of HEMA in clear cone and uh, in ultra health silicon hydrogel. Modulus 0 0.7 to 0 0.8. And comparing with ultra health, it is 0 0.5 to 0 0.8. Luminous transmittance is 95 percentage in clear cone and 97 percentage in ultra health. Wetting angle. Uh, in ultra health is 25 to 35 degree. Decay is 9.3 in clear cone and 84 in ultra health. Water content is 27 percentage in clear cone and ultra in ultra health it is 32 percentage. So this is the uh, picture of different designs of Synerge eyes in situ. So B indicates the base curve based design and C indicates the clear cone design and D indicates the hybrid ultra health hybrid lenses in the eye. Last but not the least, the scleral contact lenses, they are the last option for advanced keratoconus cases. 
So it is ideal for intolerant rigid condyle lens wearers, regardless of the stage of the disease, and it helps to delay or avoid the need for cornea surgery. So this is the picture of a scleral condyle lens in situ. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Without any further delay, let's move on to a to our next session on visual performance and comfort with row scale lens for keratoconus, handled by Ms. Jesla R.V., Optometrist Girida Eye Institute. People who are streaming live in our YouTube, drop your doubts in the comment section. Participants, feel free to ask your questions in the chat box, which will be discussed at, discussed at the end of the sessions. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to topic, uh, uh, take the topic on visual performance and comfort with Roski lens for character corners. Myself, Jasla Arvi, optometrist at Girdar Eye Institute. Uh, what is a Roski lens? A highly breathable design in which the polymers used to allow oxygen to penetrate directly through the lens that reliably corrects refractive error, be it astigmatism, myopia, or hypropia associated with keratoconus. The Roski lens closely mimics the cone shape of the cornea for every stage of corneal condition. Its complex geometry can customize to suit each eye, thereby maintain good corneal health and maximize vision by setting the optics on. What is the principle behind uh, the Roski lens? For each base curve that respects the effects of the cone, a unique axial edge lift will be associated to it. That is a unique optic zone and a unique peripheral curve. This is the image that's showing a standard lens design, which has a larger optic zone with a deep pooling and lens optic zone optimized for the cornea size. Always the axial edge lift will be closer to the cornea. What are the historical milestones in Roskato lens? It was invented by Mr. Paul Rose, an optometrist from Hamilton, New Zealand in 1987. After testing uh, 700 lenses and 12 different designs, he produced a set of 26 lenses from which all patients could be fitted. In 1990, he launched Roski lens in New Zealand market. And in 1995, he gained approval from US Food and Drug Administration for sale in America. The major features of uh, Roske 2 lenses, it is easy to fit using a simple systematic approach and a simple and flexible edge lift system is available. The good abrasion control, uh, which act as aspheric optics providing outstanding visual acuity, thereby reducing glare and flare. And the other uh, feature is a minimum lens mass. Now let's discuss about the Roske 2 family of design. There are several designs in Roske family. The first one is Roske 2, and the second one is Roske 2 MC, that is for nipple cons, and Roske 2 IC, that is for irregular cornea, Roske 2 PG, that is for uh, Roske 2 XL, and the Roske 2 XL. The Roske 2 lenses are unique geometrically designed contact lens. The design goal of the Roske 2 is to bring all focal points onto the retina at a single point, regardless of base curve, radii, or lens power, incorporate a specific eccentricity value in back optic zone. Then the stretching the optic zone without changing the fit to create the desired results in improved vision and comfort. Now let's discuss uh, each one of the designs. The first one is Roski 2. It has a multispherical posterior design, the front surface abrasion control that provides a superior vision. And in Roski 2 NC, that is for nipple cons, it is used for moderate, advanced, and any defined nipple cons. There are small aspheric back optics on diameter that decreases as the base curve steepens. 
the rapid peripheral flattening from the back optic zone uh, is very useful in this uh, fitting of the Roske to MC. In case of Roske to IC, it is for larger areas of corneal distortion. The larger overall diameter, same as the Roske to systematic fitting approach. In the Roske to post graft, that is PG, uh, it is designed for post operative recovery and for improvement in vision. It has multi spherical posterior design with reverse curve geometry. The abrasion control aspheric optics across the front and back optic zone radius. Roske to Excel, uh, it is the same as semi scleral design that provides stability and improved comfort in poor tolerance to corneal diameter lenses. It rests entirely on the cornea, just inside the limbus, and lifts over the sclera. Now let's move on to the topic, the indications of the Roske 2 lenses. There are primary and secondary indication. In case of Roske 2, it is oval keratoconus. The primary indication is uh, it can be used for oval keratoconus. The secondary indication is early nipple cons. In the case of Roske 2 NC, it is used for nipple cons and advanced oval cons. In the case of Roske 2 PG, it is used for post-graft corneas. You know that. And uh, the descendered or uh, large oval cones, any post corneal surgery, example, LASIK or penetrating keratoplasty. In the case of Roske 2 IC, it can be used for PMD, that is, pellucid marginal degeneration, keratoglobus, or LASIK induced ectasia, post graft, and also highly descendered oval cones. In the case of Roske 2 XL, uh, it is used for KC, PMD, or post graft, uh, post LASIK ectasia, post surgical, or advanced triad or corneal ring. The secondary indication of Roske to Excel is it is used for stability for sport or working environment or corneal GP intolerance or in the case of piggyback. These are the images of cone types uh, that is uh, taken by a topographer. Uh, the first one is nipple cone. You can see the image. Uh, centrally, there is a steep or uh, hot color. So the recommended design in nipple cone, it is Roske to Rose K and Rose K to IC. In the case of large oval cone, you can see the image right here. Uh, the recommended design is Rose K to Rose K and Rose K to IC, which is greater than 9.5 mm. And the pellucid marginal degeneration, the recommended design is Rose K to IC, Rose K to post graft. And in case of keratoglobus, uh, the Rose K to IC and Rose K to post graft is also used. In LASIK induced ectasia, the recommended design is Roske to IC and Roske to post club. And all this Roske to IC, that is for irregular cornea, is commonly used. Now let's discuss about the parameter range of Roske to lenses. Uh, there are several parameter range in base curve and diameter, also in the edge lift system. So the base curve of Roske 2 and Roske 2 NC range from 4.2 to 8.10 mm. Uh, in the diameter range, it is about 7.5 to 11 mm uh, in the case of Roske 2, and in Roske 2 NC, it is 7.6 to 10 mm. The edge lift of Roske 2 NC and uh, Roske 2, uh, there is standard steep fit, standard flat fit, and also standard. More lifts are all, uh, also available. We can choose it in, in a way of 0.5 step. Okay. Then Roske to IC and Roske to PG. Their base curve range starts from 5.2 mm to 12 mm, and the diameter range is about 9 to 12.5 mm. And this too, uh, we have a standard, a double standard flat and a, a double steep. More lifts are also available in, uh, in 0.5 increments. In the case of Roske to XL, it is available in 5.6 to 9.6 mm, and also the largest diameter like 13 to 16.6 mm. Okay, the power range is available up to uh, plus 40 to minus 50, and 21 options are available in 0.5 steps. Uh, the power varies with the material in place of Roske to or Roske to NC, power always varies with the material. This is the illustration of uh, available edge lift. In the case of Roske 2 and Roske 2 NC, 85% of all Roske 2 lenses utilizes either a standard or standard flat or standard steep edge lift values. Okay. Uh, the minimum flat lift is about plus 3 in Roske 2 lenses and minimum, sorry, maximum steep lift is minus 1.3 in Roske 2 lenses. In the case of Roske 2 NC, the maximum flat lift is about plus 4 and maximum steep lift is about minus 1.3. In the case of Roske 2, IC and PG, edge lift from plus 3 to minus 3 are available that uh, we can fit for all the patients. 
a maximum fit is, flat lift is plus three, which is showing in the figure, and maximum steep lift is minus three. Now let's talk about the flexible edge lift system. The peripheral fit is the single most important fitting factor for a successful and comfortable GP fit. And it is always important that the peripheral fit and the central fit is uh, mainly considering while we are using the flexible edge lift system. The all rotator lenses use a symbol value referred to as edge lift to determine the optimal peripheral configuration. After assessment, a comprehensive range of edge lifts are offered to provide the optimum amount of edge lift clearance. The final lens is always automatically compensated. And when we change the edge lift, it does not affect the central fit. These are the image showing the optimal edge lift. Uh, in case of uh, an optimal case, uh, the fluorescein band is up to 0.5 to 0.7 mm with no excessive lift or peripheral seal at any point. This is the first image showing optimal edge lift. And when the fluorescein pattern indicates edge lift in excess of 0.5 mm to 0.7 mm, uh, we need to choose a standard steep edge lift value in this case. Okay, when the fluorescein pattern indicates an edge lift less than 0.5 mm to 0.7 mm, then the standard flat edge lift value is recommended in this case. There are also more options for uh, Roskato lens. The advanced fitting options involve toric peripheral curves, asymmetric corneal technology, front, back, and bi toric designs, quadrant specific edge lift. Uh, in this case, extensive diameter and base curve ranges are available, and it fits most corneal shape size and stages of keratoconus because of its unique design. When you are starting uh, to do a trial, we need to use a diagnostic lens. That is the only way to properly assess the correct fit and final lens power. We can use topical corneal, uh, corneal anesthetic uh, when you are assessing. If it is a new patient, better to do with the uh, anesthetic drops. Otherwise, you can start without anesthetics. When selecting the initial base curve, keep in mind that the keratometer only measures the central 3 mm along the line of sight. So your first trial lens may not yield the best fit. So we need to do two or three uh, trials. So determine the appropriate roscator design for the corneal condition to be treated. That is the main point. Uh, according to the Pendicam uh, report, we can select the design, which roscator design is uh, appropriate for that condition. The fitting overview involves, step one is for base curve selection. Uh, select the base curve that yields a central fit appropriate for the design. The step two is peripheral fit. Uh, adjust the periphery to yield an even fluorescein band, 0.5 mm to 0.7 mm. In step three, the diameter is considered. Select the minimum diameter that yields good location and moment. In step four, the location. Adjust parameters such that the lens hang off the top lid and is well clear for the uh, lower limbs. In the step five, the movement is noted. Adjust parameters to achieve movements on length of 1 mm to 1.5 mm. Uh, now let's see a brief case uh, that presented in our clinic. A female with 28 years old. Uh, the purpose of visit was second opinion for cornea. And her main complaint was blurring of vision since two weeks. And consulted elsewhere, advised to see 3 r uh, Came here for a detailed evaluation and further management. The ocular history revealed that she is a known case of character bonus patient with uh, last one year from last one year, and no history of glasses or contact lens, no other family history or allergic history. The ocular examination shows that her uncorrected visual acuity in right eye is 660, in left eye it is 624. Uh, both the eyes showed a uh, dull and scissoring reflex while doing the retinoscopy. The acceptance in right, uh, right eye, uh, they both done with trial and error method. In right eye, it is minus three sphere with minus two sill at 150. And in left eye, it is minus two with minus 2.5, uh, 2.25 diopter sill at 160. And the best corrected, uh, corrected visual acuity with the uh, lens, it is uh, in right eye, it is 618 and 6, and in left eye, it is 612 and 6. This is the K reading of that patient. On slit lamp examination, noted prominent corneal nerves, thinning, walk stria, and fleischer's ring. Uh, obviously, they are the uh, signs for a keratoconus patient, and uh, consulted the doctor, and action plan was contact lens trial and review after six months for pendicam and evaluation on progression of KC, then to decide on Citria.
This is the pendicam report of that patient. Uh, the right eye shows a stiffening in the lower area. Like uh, the base curve is 7.59 uh, and the minimum um, maximum base curve it is 7.19. This is the left eye pendicam report. Patient came for the follow-up for contact lens trial. The trial done with RGP contact lens, which is a spherical RGP from pure contact. OD is corrected with a 7.5 uh, base C and diameter of 10.50 with minus 5 power. And in left eye, uh, we use the trial 7.90 base curve, diameter about 10.5 and minus 5 power, uh, the 100 DK lens. On the fit assessment, on the right eye, there was a slight edge lift and uh, there is an apical touch. Uh, still, it is uh, not that much good uh, fit, and in the left eye, it is okay. With overcorrection of uh, plus 0.75 in right eye, the vision improved to 6996, and uh, in left eye, plus 2.25, the vision improved to 6996. After the trial, the patient presented with complaint of irritation, watering, and photophobia with RGP lens, and vision also not improved even after alteration in base curve and diameter. So we advise for Rose K2 trial in next visit. And she came for a Rose K2 trial after two weeks. And we have done trial with 7.7 base curve uh, in right eye and diameter 11.20 with minus six power. And we taken the standard edge lift lens. Uh, the fit assessment was optimal. We have done uh, two, three trials. After that, we have came to this uh, final prescription and we left eye OS uh, 7.80 base curve and diameter 11.20. Uh, there is an optimal fit in, uh, in the left eye too. With over correction, the vision improved to 66 and 6 in both eyes and the final prescription is shown here. We have chose the lens uh, Rose K2 IC for irregular corneas that we can use for uh, this kind of keratoconus. And the vision improved and comfort of the patient also improved. Patient was very happy and satisfied and she insisted for uh, Rose K2 IC in left eye also. Uh, and advice follow up after two weeks with the lens on. Finally, uh, when we are talking about the advantages of Rose K2, a smart design process that uses complex computer operations and special digital aids to craft each lens to the perfect shape to suit the patient. Uh, a highly breathable design. Rose K2 has a highly breathable design that allow oxygen to penetrate directly through the lens. Uh, whether the condition is mild or advanced, Rose K lens can provide powerful vision correction. Uh, the other one is the option for customization. It can be custom designed for any eye by matching the specific corneal irregularity of the patient that we have discussed uh, just before. Their ease of use. Rose K lens are easy to insert for more clean and careful. Compared to RGP lens, the success rate was uh, very much higher in the case of Rose K2 lens. The Rose K2 lenses are a viable alternative in the visual rehabilitation of patients with the keratoconus in case of their comfort or vision. So Rose K lens plays an important role in patients with keratoconus. And that is the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jisla. Since we haven't received any questions in the YouTube comment section as well as in our chat group, we are moving to the next section beyond the corneal borders and it will be handled by Ms. Taslima, optometrist of Girida Eye Institute. Moving to you, ma'am.
Okay. Good afternoon all. Here I am briefly talking about some basic aspects of clerical contact lenses. First of all, what are scleral contact lenses? Scleral contact lenses are large diameter GP contact lens that rest beyond the limits of cornea and extend onto the sclera. It traps a lot of fluid reservoir between posterior surface of the lens and anterior surface of the cornea. It has unique fitting and aftercare characteristics. The Scleral Lens Education Society introduced an internationally recognized nomenclature for describing scleral lenses based on its uh, resting area on ocular surface. A lens that completely rests on the cornea is called as cornea lenses. Uh, a lens that partly rests on the cornea and partly on the sclera is called as cornea scleral lenses. And a lens that completely uh, rests on the sclera is scleral lenses. It is again subdivided into mini scleral lenses and large scleral lenses. A lens with a diameter up to 6 mm larger than HVAD is mini scleral lenses. Uh, more than 6 mm larger than HVAD is large scler scleral lenses. Usually, corneal design uh, has diameter range between 8 to 12.5. For corneal scale lenses, it is 12.6 to 15 mm. And mini scale lenses usually have diameter range between 15 to 17.9 mm. Uh, large scale lenses uh, are larger than 18 mm in diameter. Then coming to historical milestones, the scleral contact lens was first uh, described in um, uh, medical literature and in late 80s uh, researchers in uh, Germany developed and started using uh, blown glass shell for the treatment of keratoconus. They are completely impermeable to oxygen and very difficult to manufacture and uh, not easily reproducible. Later in uh, 900s, uh, reintroduced in the advent of PMMA material. PMMA is also impermeable to oxygen and um, they have used impression mold technique for this. The developers started making lenses small and fenestrated to allow the tear to flow under the contact lens and increase oxygen. In 1970, clear lenses were reintroduced again in RGP materials. By 1990, several, several milestones were reached with well-defined fit, fitting techniques and technological innovations in the design and manufacturing of lens leading to better performance. Then coming to lens materials, uh, the scleral lens material evolved, evolved from PMMA, which has a diffusion coefficient of zero, to currently available high and ultra decay materials. For example, Boston XO, XO2, Manicon, Paragon Extra. And scleral lenses are considerably thicker as compared to GP lenses, uh, usually ranges between 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 mm. And uh, it varies, depends on uh, design. And the thickness tends to increase from the uh, center to periphery. And it Thicker lens would have a uh, lower decay, and most of the lenses are plasma treated to increase the wettability. Then, how are scleral lenses different? Why do scleral uh, lenses become more popular nowadays? There are some couple of reasons for this. Uh, main reason is uh, comfort. Scleral lenses are uh, secured under the eyelids, which does not rub against cornea and uh, eyelid, and it lands on the bulbar conjunctiva, which is less densely innervated as compared to cornea. And these have a larger diameter, uh, so they are well centered and very stable. So if a patient complaining of frequent pops out of uh, GP lenses, mm -hmm. Lenses would be a better uh, option for them because it prevents dislodging and it has a larger optic zone, so it um, prevents vision from fluctuating. And these uh, uh, lenses are filled with uh, non-preservative salines, so that keep the eye moisturized and lubricated all the day, which increases the wearing time. Then coming to indications, uh, first of all, uh, vision improvement, then ocular surface protection, then sports and cosmetic indication. Scleral lenses are mainly used to improve the vision on corneal uh, irregularities. Corneal irregular irregularities comprises uh, primary corneal ectasia and secondary corneal ectasia. Primary corneal ectasia includes keratoconus, keratoglobus, and pellucidal marginal degeneration. Then uh, secondary corneal ectasia includes post-refractive surgeries such as LASIK, LASIK, PRK, and RK. And uh, it also includes uh, corneal ectasia resulting from a corneal trauma. 
then uh, scleral lenses can also be given for those with uh, high myopia, hypermetropia, and aphasia. Then it has an important role in the ma management of ocular surface diseases, which includes uh, any disorder of the tear film or abnormality in eyelid structure or function that could result in compromise to the ocular surface. <clears throat> It has a great impact on the management of severe dry eye conditions, such as Jogren uh, syndrome, uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, uh, then uh, limbal cell deficiency, ocular cicatricial hemigoid, uh, persistent epithelial defects, etc. because of the retention of fluid between the uh, lens and the uh, cornea. It also helps in the uh, management of corneal expert. It also helps to... Uh, it acts as a protective devices in corneal exposure, such as uh, the eyelid coloboma and the uh, corneal uh, nerve pulses. You can see here uh, the first picture. In the first picture, there are uh, significant uh, corneal staining is there before the start of wearing clear contact lenses. After two months of uh, lens wear, the uh, staining significantly reduced. Here, uh, the scleral lenses can also be given for those with active water sports, such as water skiing, water polo, then diving, canoeing, etc., and uh, those with exposure to uh, dusty environment. The printed uh, scleral lens can be given for uh, improving cosmetical appearance in cases such as atrophic bulbae, then to reduce uh, glare in conditions of uh, anodity and albinism. And cosmetically, uh, scleral lenses can be given for doses also. A larger diameter significantly vaulted um, scleral lens will increase the aperture size as shown in the picture. This is the picture of a uh, Hollywood actor, Tom Cruise, uh, who uh, you have used clear lens for uh, protecting his eyes and enabled them to open while exposing high speed wind as he was hanging on a fighter jet flying 5,000 feet above from the grounds. Then when do you consider clear contact lenses? Uh, Keratoconus patients usually have a high level of toricity. Uh, a scleral lens with significantly vaulting on the cornea will correct these irregularities. And uh, these have larger optic zones. So it is particularly important in patients with keratocon uh, descended keratoconus and um, keratoglobus. And for those with uh, complex corneal uh, shapes that resulting from a keratoplastic surgery, uh, these uh, lens would be the first options in uh, nowadays become the first option uh, in uh, current practices. So uh, because uh, the scale lenses, uh, fitting of scale lenses is comparably, comparably easy as uh, compared to other lenses because of because the scleral lens profile remains same even after the surgery. And some studies shows that many of the patients are referred for uh, keratoplasties uh, were successfully fitted with uh, lenses. So it is uh, important to uh, assess the how much visual acuity can be improved uh, with um, uh, available contact lens option, variety of contact lens options, including clear lens uh, before uh, referring for a uh, corneal transplant. Then coming to lens designs, it consists of optical zone, transient zone, and landing zone. Optical zone is the centermost zone of um, scleral lenses and it carries desired optical power. And a front surface may be either spherical or aspheric. This aspheric design helps to uh, reduce aberration to a higher level and the back surface uh, approximately aligned with the cornea. Then transient zone, the zone between optical zone and landing zone is transient zone and it is also called as mid peripheral zone or limbal zone. It determines the sagittal height of the lens. If we are changing the sagittal height of a lens, we are actually changing the uh, transient zone without affecting optical and landing zone. Then finally, landing zone. 
this is the uh, zone uh, which is also called as level zone or haptic zone it is defined as a flat curve or a series of curves ranging from 13.5 mm to 14.5 mm the area where the uh, lens rests and align with the anterior ocular surface that is called a landing zone then uh, toric designs Scleral lenses are also uh, available in toric forms, uh, which includes uh, front toric design, back toric design, and bi toric design. In front toric design, the toric surface is positioned on the front surface of a uh, central optical zone to improve visual performance. In back toric design, the landing zone area is made toric to improve lens fit. It does not interfere with a uh, central zone. In biotoric design, it combines the fitting characteristics of uh, bacteric uh, lens, uh, bacteric design with the optical benefits of uh, frontoric design. Then coming to disadvantages, the lack of specialist practitioners, then long fitting time, then greater expense and limited availability. That's all about my presentation and uh, the fitting uh, of the lens will be discussed in the next session by Mr. Swastik. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slima. We are approaching to the end of our webinar. The last session will be handled by Mr. Swastik, Business Development Manager, V Square Meditate Private Limited. He worked at Karthik Netralaya, Bangalore, as consultant of optometrist and HOD of contact lens department for three years. He also worked with Manicon Resolution as consultant of top interest for Rose K and Manicon products in charge for South Indian division for three years. Now joined with B-Square Meditech Private Limited as business development manager for Aculens, GOV and Keracare products. Handing over to you, sir. A general reminder that we will have a discussion at the end of this session and feel free to drop your questions in the chat box. Thank you for the good introduction. Uh, welcoming everyone. Uh, this session is all about uh, Keracare scleral lenses. Before I go into the details of fitting the lenses, uh, I would like to introduce Keracare uh, scleral lenses, which is from US. Uh, Aculens Laboratories are the ones which uh, designs the lenses. Uh, going into the detail, uh, when we get the patients, when we get keratoconus patients, the first thing what we do the lens is uh, to fit the lenses. Uh, scleral lenses are always the better option. Why? Because uh, it gives the outstanding comfort and the exceptional vision. How do that do? It increase the large, the diameter is very large and there will be no absolutely no movement. It doesn't touches the cornea and it always watches the cornea. It crosses the limbus and it doesn't land on the limbus. So few important things before we start going into the fitting of scleral lenses. The very important thing is about uh, clearing the limbus. None of the lenses should, none of the lenses should land on the limbus. It should go beyond the limbus because landing landing on the limbus has its own complications. It can start uh, edema, neovascularizations can happen, uh, keratitis can happen because the landing zone is on the limb, limbus. The other important thing what we should keep in mind is about the diameter of scleral lenses, which should be minimum four mm beyond the HVID. So 2 mm in the nasal side and 2 mm in the temporal side. So the diameter of the cornea lenses has to be decided based on the HVID of the cornea. So it has to be nearly 4 mm beyond the limbus. <clears throat> so we also have a study which says that the scleral lenses are much better compared to the corneal scleral lenses or the mini scleral lenses available in the market. So why is uh, scleral lenses more important? Because it clears the limbus. So the size of the lenses is very, very important. As again told, it should not land on the limbus. And again, it should be not very big because it will be very uncomfortable for the patient. So it can also create conjunctival prolapse and other things. So sorry for the interruption. I think the slide is not changing. Okay. We are still we are still seeing the first slide itself. <clears throat> now yes, now the slides are visible. Yeah. Uh, so I'll start from first then. 
we were audible you are audible but we have been okay. able to see you yeah so i was talking about this initially so the diameter of this <clears throat> the diameter of the scleral lens is very very important because it gives the best comfort and the exceptional vision clearing the limbus is very very important again we being a practitioner none of the lenses should land on the sclera so the corneal scleral lenses or the mini scleral lenses which has lesser diameter lands on the sclera and lands on the limbus so all the lenses should land on the sclera creating a vault in the limbus the minimal scleral diameter as a study says is about nearly 4 mm more than the hvid so it has to be nearly 2 mm to the nasal side and 2 mm to the temporal side so the diameter of the sclera lens depends on the hvid of the cornea so it has to be nearly 3.5 to 4 mm more than the hvid so we also have a study which says the sclera lenses are much much better uh, when compared to the mini sclera or the corneal sclera lenses uh, in the market for uh, corneal ectasia and dry eye cases so the size of the cornea uh, it should be nearly 4 mm beyond the limbus and it should not be beyond 4 mm also because it might be difficult for the patient to wear and remove the lenses number one and it can also create conjunctival prolapse if the lenses are too big <clears throat> so what makes the uh, corneal fitting uh, sclera lens fitting very comfortable one is the proper size what we aim is for nearly 2 mm uh, i'm i'm sorry to interrupt again uh, your slides seems to be stuck and you are not in the you know full screen mode yeah can you go into the in a presentation mode please now is fine sir uh, no now mm, no actually it has not gone into the presentation mode yet probably you can you know yeah, stop like sharing and reshare once more yeah now it's fine can you try moving your slide just yeah, see if it is moving here no it has gone out of slide presentation i'll try moving yes yeah fine now sir yeah moving it's moving please do continue yeah so the size of the sclera lenses is very important so uh, it should not land on the limbus it should go beyond the limbus and it should be it shouldn't be too big also because it can create conjunctival prolapse so proper size of the lenses is very important 2 mm beyond the limbus uh, to the nasal side and to the temporal side so it has to be nearly 3.5 to 4 mm more than the hvid the proper vault is very important uh, nearly what we aim is for the 150 microns of vault in between the lens and the cornea the proper ridge we should not blanch or it should not lift so we don't see movement in scleral lenses so what does keracare do keracare have a uh, toric peripheries where the vertical meridian is steepened and the horizontal meridian is flattened we also have a uh, front surface toric design where toric toric cylindrical parts can be incorporated we have something called as limbal curve indicators which clearly says where the landing zone is so i'll come in detail to that multifocals are also available the center distance and center uh, near design we can uh, oblate the design by increasing or decreasing the vault because all these uh keracare sclera lenses are designed with cad and cam technologies where we can uh technically tell what we require like 50 microns increase the vault or decrease the vault whatever is needed all these lenses are high definition optic designs and uh, optic zones can also be altered 
these all these are on point technology designs where any branching in the particular meridians can be altered like we can also uh, make the changes only at one particular meridian or quadrant modifications are available and also a full edge modifications are also available hydropack coatings uh, is very important because these are hydrophobic coating which doesn't uh, which improves the wettability of the lenses so that the lenses can be worn at a stretch of nearly 10 hours uh, at a stretch regularly every day so how do we fit the scleral lenses so initially we start with the lens diameter, we make sure that the lens diameter has to be nearly 2 mm beyond the limbus. Then we select the sag of the lenses. Uh, I'll come in detail. Edge of the lenses has to be evaluated. Then the over refraction and centration has to be observed. These are the five steps what we see. First is size, which makes sure the diameter of the lenses. Sagittal height, the base curve and sag values. The edge of the lenses has to be assessed. And then the over refraction and centration. So this is the trial set what we have and trial set considers two different uh, base uh, two different diameters 15.9 and 16.4 these are the available diameters in the trial set so for moderate and advanced keratoconus uh, we prefer 15.9 diameter and for severe keratoconus we prefer a larger diameter called 16.4 again the hvid does matter for pellucid marginal degenerations we prefer 15.9 and for post RK cases or any transplants, we prefer 16.4 little larger diameter. The base curve of the lenses is selected based on uh, the, ele the elevation of the cornea. So the moderate and advanced cones, we prefer 7.5 base curve lenses. For more advanced uh, cones, we prefer slightly more uh, sagittal height values. <clears throat> so this is the actual eye. And all the Skeracare scleral lenses does come with all these engravings. You can see the engravings here and the engravings here. So the center has grid markings and the peripheral has something called as LCI, which indicates the landing zone. So initially we first select the diameter of the lenses. The lens should nearly cross 2 mm beyond the limbus. So again, it depends on the HVID. For smaller corneas, we prefer smaller lenses. And for larger corneas, we prefer larger lenses. We have called as LCI, which is limbal curve indicators. This is how it looks like. So this limbal curve indicators indicates the landing zone of the lenses. So none of these lenses, none of the sclera lenses should land on the limbus. It should go beyond the limbus and land on the sclera. So these LCI, indicates the landing zone which gives the clear picture of the cornea uh, the, of the scleral lens diameter so we call it as a b and c from the inner side the a or in between a and b should be the limbus so when we fit the lenses we fit the lenses and make sure that the lci marking is in the temporal quadrant and in the temporal quadrant if this is a and the middle one is b and the outer one is c so the limbus should correlate with A or it should be in between A and B. This indicates the diameter of the lens is ideal. And as told earlier, so if the lens, if the limbus is sitting on B, then we increase the diameter. If it is sitting in between uh, B and C, we increase the diameter by 0.5 mm. If it is sitting in C or beyond C, then we increase the lens, lens diameter by 1 mm. So this is how we come to conclusion. Imagine if we have fitted 15.9 diameter lenses and if the limbus is in between A and B, then the lens diameter is ideal. If the lim limbus is beyond C, then we increase the diameter by 1 mm and we directly go to 16.9 lenses. It's like that. So this gives the picture of the lens diameter. So the size of the lenses is first evaluated. Next comes the sagittal height. So Again, it depends on the elevation. The higher the corneal elevation, we go for higher sag values. Lower the corneal elevation, we go for lower sag values. So assessing the vault is very, very important in uh, scleral lenses. And these are the different pictures of vault. If you see the second line, the first line is the lens, the front surface of the lens. And the second line is the vault. So ideally, what we see is for 150 microns of vault, once the lenses are settled. So initially, the, when, we when we put the lenses, 
it will be more and once after settling it should be nearly 150 microns of vault in between the lens and the cornea so as we all know that we fill a saline inside the lenses and the saline remains there throughout until we remove the lenses and the saline vault is what we see so if it is steep like 600 microns or 500 microns we go flatter or if it is flat like 50 microns then we go to the steeper side <clears throat> So how much clearance is required? So when we put the lenses, uh, if the microns is nearly 300, 250 to 300 microns in immediately after insertion, then leave it alone. Once the lenses center, settled after one hour, it may reduce to around 150 to 200 microns. So we should see after one hour. So the lenses should be settled uh, in the eye for one hour. And then we have to reassess the vault, which gives nearly a rough picture of 100 to 150 microns. That is the ideal vault what we see. The third thing is what we see is for the landing zones, which is again saw in the first, first step itself. So the landing zone, it should not land on the cornea or on the limbus. It should directly go beyond the uh, limbus. So the first picture, if this is the case, the landing zone, if you see this is on the limbus. So if it is on the limbus or on the, on the cornea, we increase the diameter of the lenses. So make sure that the landing zone is always on the sclera, not on the limbus. So evaluating the edge is the third step. Ideal edge lift is that the blood vessels should clearly pass through the lenses. So if there's an impingement like this, so the blood vessels are stopped there, which creates redness again. So in these cases, we can modify the edges. We increase the diameter, we increase the edges, we flatten them or we can steepen them. So in the third step, in the third picture there, if it is flatter, we can also steepen them. So this is the ideal edge modification available in uh, the ideal alignment, what we aim for. If you see this is the impingement of the uh, scleral lenses, where we flatten the edge of the lens. And these are the compressions where we can also flatten the edges or change the diameter. This looks a little larger diameter. We also have something called as on point technology where uh, every point uh, of the scleral lenses can be customized. Uh, we can modify the edges only at one particular meridian, or we can also modify the vault at only one particular meridian. So anything can be done using these grids and LCI. So as I told, we do the over refraction after assessing the edges and after over refraction, we make sure that, that the lenses are centered well. So if the lenses are not centered, it's not only for multifocal lenses, even for single monofocal lenses, we make sure that the lens are centered well and the optic zone of the lenses are correlating with the pupillary area. If it is not, then we can also uh, ensure, we can ask the laboratory to make the modifications. I'll come to those modifications later. So this is what we aim for, the size of the lenses. It has to be nearly two mm beyond the limbus and the coverage has to be absolutely centered well. There should be a good proper vault. Uh, what we aim is for around 100 to 150 microns of vault once the lenses are settled and absolutely no movement and no blanching of blood vessels. All these Keracare sterile lenses are made up of a technology called CAD and CAM. Uh, it's computerized aided design, computerized um, design. Uh, and all these lenses are treated some, with plasma coating. So any modifications can be addressed. So surface wetting issues is also important when, when we talk about scleral lenses because majorly all scleral lenses we prefer uh, to wear them for nearly four to six hours and remove them refill the saline wear them again which is uh, slightly irritating to the patients so we kera care lenses have something called as hydra peg coating which is hydrophobic coating uh, on the lenses and all these lenses are made up of quantamax extreme which is the highest decay value again uh, and all these lenses have the lowest wetting angle and which gives the best uh, uh, comfort to the patient. So all these lenses can be worn at a stretch of nearly 10 hours regularly with the help of this Contamac extreme material because this is the lowest wetting angle material available and also hydra pack coating which increases the which uh, gives the better comfort. <clears throat> So what does hydra pack coating do? It increases the wettability of the lens. It increases the lens surface water retentions, which helps in minimizing the deposits and lens fogging. So 
uh, which is this is the major technique which uh, technology which none other none of the other lenses have because all other scleral lenses prefer uh, they do uh, wear them for four to six hours and remove them uh, refill the saline and again wear them with these lenses with hydropack coating uh, that is not required patient can wear at a stretch of nearly 10 to 12 hours in a day at a stretch multifocals are also available with us which means that the near multifocal aspheric designs and also the toric multifocals are also available we have two multifocal uh, variants uh, we have a center uh, distance design and the center near design as well this depends on the uh, addition and power what we prescribe we also have uh, something called as launched which which we la launched recently uh, called as keracare 3d lenses which is uh, free from design it is also called as maxim 3d uh, outside india so the specialty of these lenses are all these lenses are made up of on point technology where a simple fitting uh, patterns are, are uh, advised and uh, empirical fitting is also uh, possible we use pentacam where uh, upgrade is required uh, using the pentacam csp design and the and the software itself uh, prefers what base curve what diameter has to be fitted so this is very helpful for the laboratory where uh, which also takes care of the scleral toricity as well so any modifications like uh, any one point modifications each quadrant modifications uh, imagine if there's a blanching only at one quadrant like three o'clock position we can only modify at three o'clock position where other designs we have to modify all over uh, the lens uh, we also have quadrant modifications where only three o'clock to six o'clock position can be modified we can also alter the vault by increasing or decreasing at the center or in the limbus so if the lenses are landing on the limbus then we can ask to vault on the limbus all these modifications can be addressed we have something called as acute vault which helps in uh, improving the comfort in pingucular cases or any bell form formations in such cases uh, this is the design where the edge of the design will be completely customized according to the sclera the scleral toricity can be addressed as well and uh, this is the study on uh, the centration of the lenses uh, iols uh, do, do decenter and that creates a lot of abrasion values and uh, when it comes to contact lenses contact lenses are also slightly decentered or uh, it is uh, out of the pupillary area the optic zones uh, in such cases we can customize using this on point uh, technology uh, Caracare 3D lenses can be customized with optic zones. We can increase the optic zone or we can even uh, make sure that the optic zone is on the pupillary area by addressing these uh, grids. So these three grids formations, if you see uh, the center, this part, there are five grids totally and the center, the second and the third and the fourth is in between the pupillary area. So then we make sure, write to the laboratory that three hash marks inside the pupillary area at zero axis. The second thing, if we also see that here, there are nearly three again, three hash marks at 90 degree axis. And here it is nearly four hash marks. So which is at 45 degree. So we can also send the particular picture of these grid designs when we fit the lenses and as a laboratory to do, or we can also mention these indications, whatever we see, so that the laboratory can clearly understand and can modify the lenses accordingly. So this is what we order for in such cases to alter the uh, optic zones. So what does scleral lenses do? It is definitely a life-changing for uh, all keratoconus patients or coronary irregular patients because it gives the better, best vision uh, because uh, it does perfectly shape the eyeball it doesn't move and it's more healthier because it's all it is already it's always uh baths with uh, the, the saline uh, which is fda approved for dry eye also so it is also more comfortable because it doesn't touch your cornea it completely goes beyond the limbus and rests on the sclera uh, which gives the better comfort so this practice of contact lenses uh, is very very useful because it builds the person satisfaction and also the practice builder which is also which also makes the patient uh, very loyal to you which makes a difference for both patients as well as uh, for us thank you virudhara hospital for su having such a, pro a best 
presentation today and uh, this this is from v square thank you thank you sir uh, we have received some queries from our participants one such question is is it possible to incorporate multifocal and toric designs for keratoconus yes ma'am possible with uh, keratoconus scleral lenses we have multifocal designs as well as multifocal toric designs as well uh, next one is blanching is a serious concern in scleral fitting to how extent it can be resolved with the, with the help of keratoconus keratoconus sorry yeah blanching should definitely be not not there with any of the scleral lenses so keracare has something called as on point technology or customized uh, modifications where we can flatten the edges or steepen the edges according to the requirement so imagine if there is only blanching at one particular meridian like i already told if it is at 3 o'clock position there is a blanching and we can ask the laboratory to only flatten the lenses at 3 o'clock position so keratoconus scleral lenses are designed with cad and cam technology where uh, quadrant modifications or point modifications or edge lift modifications can be done uh, we have one more question here most of the many scleral lens is advised for 6 hour continuous wearing schedule but in case of steven johnson syndrome it is for 2 hours so what about keratoconus yes there's a very good question ma'am uh yes all uh, the lesser the diameter of the lenses we uh, and the material uh, this makes that the comfort also reduce we uh, may we ask the patient to uh, remove the lens, lenses frequently and refill the saline but with keratoconus scleral lenses in keratoconus patients uh, because of this hydrapack coating and uh, also the contamac material which gives the better comfort and decrease increases the wettability we can ask the patients to regularly wear at a stretch of nearly 10 to 12 hours in a day they don't have to remove them in dry eye cases uh, we advise them for nearly 6 to 8 hours they they have to remove the lenses so it is definitely much better than uh, any other uh, lens any other scleral lenses in the market thank you sir now we came to the conclusion of this webinar i welcome ms asi aman for the word of thanks Good afternoon all. On behalf of Girida I Institute and Susruta School of Optometry and Visual Science, I would like to take this opportunity to propose word of thanks to those who have directly and indirectly contributed to Insight 2K22 webinar on role of specialty contact lens in keratoconus and myopia control. First of all, I spread my thanks to the, to the Almighty for making this event successful. Next, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to Mr. Vikas Chaturvedi, General Manager of V-Square Meditech Private Limited for spending his valuable time with us and also enlightening us with the newest approach to myopia control and orthokeratology. Next, I would like to thank Mr. Swastik, Business Development Manager, V-Square Meditech Private Limited for sharing his valuable knowledge on Keracare scleral contact lens fitting. I spread my sincere thanks to Dr. Vinay Spillay, Senior Consultant, HOD of Cornea and Refractive Surgeries, Gridhar Eye Institute, for his session on interpreting corneal topography, which is a great help for the budding optometrist. An event of this dimension can happen overnight and needs meticulous planning and execution. So I thank Ms. Anu Kuriakos, HOD of Optometry Department, who played the greatest part in organizing and hosting this successful event. Moreover, I would also like to thank you for the interesting session on orthokeratology. Next, I take this opportunity to thank all the presenters, Ms. Parvati, lecturer of Susruta School of Optometry and Visual Science, Ms. Jesla Arvi and Ms. Taslima NS, optometrist, Kirita Eye Institute for their contribution in this event. I would also like to thank the entire technical committee who provided all technical support for the smooth functioning of this webinar and also the participants for the valuable comments which helped to improve the quality of presentation. A special thanks to the organizing committee for their extreme support and coordination. Once again, I thank all of you for the part participating in this webinar. By this, we have moved on to the end of our session. Thank you all. Anyone who stops learning is all, whether at 20 or 80. Anyone who keeps learning stays in. These are the words of Henry Ford. By taking these words ahead, we are concluding our webinar, Inside 2K22. Thank you all.